pleasure. My, my, um, uh, the, the title of these lectures uh, that, I, that I've given is, it, uh, announced is Things a Computer Scientist Rarely Talks About, and the subtitle is Interactions Between Faith and Computer Science. Uh, I'm here because computer science is wonderful, but it isn't everything. So today, I want to go beyond technical stuff to consider um, other things that I value. In this series, I'm going to be giving six talks that are more or less independent of each other. Um, they, uh, Anna asked me to, to give uh, between five and ten lectures, uh, and I decided on six because I could think of six jokes. That I could <laughs> yeah, and that was the first. That, what? what? So, okay. Well, I, I have to tell jokes once in a while to see if you can really hear me. I don't know. Um, now, um, the first reaction what, that I had uh, when I when I was invited to give these talks was uh, to, um, uh, to say, "No way! This is impossible. The whole subject is is obviously way too deep for me." Um, I've given lots of talks at universities during the past 40 years, but they were always to present solutions to problems, to proofs of math theorems, precise analysis of computational tasks, you know, general theories to organize bodies of knowledge, and things like that. Uh, things that I suppose I'm reasonably good at. But surely I can't uh, come before you today and pretend to be an expert on faith or God, much less to complain that, uh, to, <laughs> to claim that I have any solutions to problems that have challenged and baffled the best minds of uh, uh, human minds for thousands of years. Uh, so uh, it's especially terrifying to me to see so many of you here because I hate to disappoint you. Uh, <coughs> I have a PhD which makes me a doctor of philosophy, but it doesn't make me a philosopher. The PhD was in math. Um, I can do math and computer science okay, but my formal training in religious studies is basically nil since high school. I've done a lot of reading in my spare time, but why should I expect you to listen to me talking about one of my hobbies? When I read what other people have written about matters of faith, it's quite clear to me that my own ideas don't measure up to those of world-class the philosophers and theologians. I'm not too bad at reacting to other people's notions of religion, um, but I'm not uh, too good at introducing anything that is fundamentally new or important in this area. In other words, as far as theology goes, I'm a user, not a developer. <laughs> now, um, a week and a half ago, I went to Memorial uh, ch Chapel at Harvard and, uh, uh, and was in the audience when Billy Graham came. And uh, I'm happy to say that he had uh, uh, not only a standing room only crowd, but but uh, he but uh, you know he, he filled the aisles and the doorways. Uh, uh, and and and, and uh, hello. And and well, he he deserves it. Um, uh, but I'm. <laughs> yeah. We. This is great. <clears throat> We used to have a we used to have a printer that would talk to us at random moments. Oh. Okay. okay. So um, I'm surprised to see so many of you here when you could have seen Jesse Ventura. Um, oh. Uh, 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 yeah. Okay. Well, so uh, uh, turning things around. What if an eminent theologian were to give a series of lectures about computer programming. Uh, would I go out of my way to go to hear them? Uh, would I find them of value afterwards? Um, not sure. Uh, <laughs> on the other hand, all computer people present here today know that discussions of CS are not totally different from discussions of religion, um, you know, especially when we consider languages for computer programming. It, in the 60s, people would often talk about Algol theologians. These were people who, was, who were skilled in the exegesis of obscure texts passed down by international committees. <laughs> o over the years, numer you know, we, we had many different, uh, uh, we, we could use all the analogies of, of religious studies uh, when we were discussing computer languages. And, and over the years, numerous high priests of programming have expounded one language or one methodology over another with religious zeal, and they often have uh, very uh, fanatical disciples. Um, so uh, it, you know, everyone knows the world of Computer science is full of cults. So I guess religion and CS are not totally separate. They, they share a fair amount of common ground. Um, of course, we're all familiar with C.P. Snow's famous metaphor of the two cultures, 
which separate us into two camps. Last month, I, I was in England. I visited the, the new British Library in London, a magnificent building that's built to last at least 200 years. Uh, it just opened, I think, in February. And I learned that it, com it actually enshrines the notion of two cultures permanently in stone. The new British Library has two separate sections and two separate reading rooms, one for the humanities and one for the sciences. Uh, it turns out that there are good reasons for this from the librarian standpoint. The humanists tend to work with a small number of books from the historic collections, while the scientists tend to work with lots of books from current periodicals. So the architect gave the humanists a big room with lots of desks in the middle, surrounded by reference works on the, on the four walls, while the scientists got a room with lots of journals in the middle, surrounded by uh, desks on four sides. You see, you see he, give, he gives the, the, uh, uh, the one-dimensional thing to the, uh, to the desks for the scientists and, and the two-dimensional thing to the journals, but he switches the dimensions for the human. Now, now, actually this week, Stanford is dedicating its new library. And, uh, and, so, and henceforth, in Stanford's uh, library, we're not going to have two cultures, but three. Uh, humanities, sciences, and social sciences. Um, and everybody knows, of course, that engineering is yet another culture. The, the truth is, in fact, that C.P. Snow got it all wrong by at least an order of magnitude. Um, there are many more than two cultures. Uh, I think a lot of you know that Macintosh adds uh, telling us to think different. Uh, from my own corner of the academic world, I know, for example, that physicists think different from mathematicians. Mathematicians who do algebra think different from mathematicians who do geometry. Both kinds of mathematicians think different from computer scientists who work on algorithms, and so on and so on. Uh, people often decry this lack of unity in, uh, in the knowledge of the world, but let's face it, people are different, and vive la différence. Now, even if people did think alike, and, and they don't, uh, people, uh, we, we would have to, in universities to cope with the vast growth of knowledge. In, in my own field, for example, it was once possible for a grad student of the 60s to learn just about everything there was to know about computer science. Nowadays, the subject is so enormous, nobody can hope to cover more than a tiny portion of it. Um, for, you know, I receive, on the average, at least one copy of a journal every day. Uh, it's actually, it's more like uh, uh, eight or nine per week. Um, and uh, these are just the ones I subscribe to, not the ones that I, that I find in the library. And, and uh, it, they're filled with good stuff, and it represents only a small fraction of my corner of the field. Growth is relentless. Uh, so a uh, constant trend towards more and more specialization I is inevitable. Um, we have to concentrate on a small part of the world's knowledge if we have any hope of, of continuing to advancing it. Um, there, there might be, uh, uh, there might be uh, uh, some light on the horizon, however. Uh, uh, I, I predict that in the not-too-distant future, uh, people in academic life are going to define themselves not by one specialty area, but by two subspecialties that belong to two rather different main specialties. Uh, this means that we'll have a web of interests in which each person will serve as a bridge between different parts of the overall structure. You see, this is much better than having a tree that continues to branch, and branch out and out further and further and, and, and uh, nobody being able to talk to somebody on another branch. We'll have people that each uh, belong to two branches that are, that are in different parts, and then, and then we'll be able to have some, some hope of coping with the knowledge as it, as it comes. Maybe 50 more years go by, people will have three sub-subspecialties. Sub, sub I don't know. But anyway, uh, um, in any case, besides the specialties that people will have in such a fu future uh, scenario, we'll also want to know something about other people's specialties, just as we do today. And as today, we want to know about our place in the universe and our relationship to God, even if we aren't specialists in cosmology or theology. From this perspective, it's, it is surely not forbidden for people like me to grapple with questions of religion, nor for theologians to grapple with questions of computation. And I can explain why my, and I can explain uh, the results of my grapplings to people who are like me, um, probably better than a person with a different mode of thinking could do it. Uh, in fact, it's the same reason that, that uh, other people than me would be much better uh, to explain to my mother how to use Lotus 1, 2, 3. She, she would need someone who, who, who thinks like she does in order to 
in order to explain um, the ideas of, of, of that work, even though I'm supposed to know more about computer. So things a computer scientist rarely talks about. In, in my Stanford classes, of course, I never would speak about kinds of things that I plan to discuss in these lectures. Um, at Stanford, I, I did have a tradition of setting aside the last day of every course for a special Q&A session. Um, at which I would promise, I promised to answer any question that the students had on any subject uh, except questions about religion or politics. <laughs> you know, religion is taboo at Stanford, although other kinds of knowledge are not, and I guess that makes sense. Uh, on the other hand, I remember reading a letter to the editor of the Caltech alumni magazine many years ago. The writer said that uh, during the first 10 years after he graduated, he wished he'd had more training in his major field. Then during the next 10 years, he wished he'd had more training in management. During the next 10, he wished he'd had more training in business planning. Then for another 10, in the 10, he wished he'd learn more about medicine and health. And, um, <laughs> and during, the, during the next 10, he wished he'd, had, he'd learn more about theology. Um, so I, I've been concerned for a long time, in fact, about the lack of material about theology that's, that is written for people like me. Um, there's plenty of books for other kinds of people, it seems, but not, not, not very much for me. I, I can remember once going into a large uh, so-called Christian bookstore and realizing that how, almost all of my professional colleagues would find it uh, extremely oppressive just to be in that room. Um, I'm disturbed by the notions of religion that many of my colleagues have, um, but I, I, I see that th their, their, um, their notions were formed quite naturally in reaction to the things that, that, they, that they experience in the media that are aimed at different subcultures. Um, but from my point of view, uh, the way they look at, at uh, religion is strange and totally distorted from the kind of religion that I grew up with. So when uh, I was asked to give a series of lectures in this God and Computers program at MIT, my first reaction of no way can I contribute anything of quality was tempered by second thought that maybe I could say a few things that would be helpful to some of the people in this audience. Uh, naturally, I never agree to give a talk unless I think I have something to say. In this case, I realized that there is one important message that I can bring to you that no theologian could ever do, precisely because of my amateur status. Namely, I can give testimonials that theologians have basically done a good job. Uh, after looking at hundreds of their books, I can report as an essentially disinterested observer that a lot of their work is both interesting and valuable, uh, it was both interesting and valuable to me as I uh, uh, continue to seek to know more about God. Um, I can explain to other people who share my own peculiar way of thinking what I've learned by reading works outside my own field of expertise. Please realize that these lectures don't represent a career change for me. Um, <laughs> This is a once-in-a-lifetime thing, after which I'm going to go back home and continue working on the stuff I do best. I want to use this opportunity to say things about which I feel deeply, even though other people could say them better, partly to inspire those other people to come forward and advance the discussion. Uh, but given that, um, I, um, uh, I'm, I'm glad to attempt this just once, and what better place to do it than here at MIT? Now, of course, it's impossible to talk about religious issues without any bias, and so I have to explain to you where I'm coming from. I was born in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I grew up as a member of the Lutheran Church, and I went to grade school and high school in Lutheran schools. Uh, my father devoted his lifetime to Christian education in the Lutheran school system. I attended church regularly, but uh, Sunday morning was a separate compartment of my life. I had a kind of a cozy relationship with the church, I didn't feel a need to explore any alternatives. I had several excellent pastors, but I didn't know much about other people's faith. I was plenty busy with computer science and math more than six days per week. Um, important change came for me. It began in the fall of 1976 when I decided it would be interesting to learn more about the Bible by applying some of the techniques that I'd been using uh, in learning about computer programs uh, and, and learning about other complicated subjects. I decided uh, that year, for reasons I'm going to explain to you next week, I decided to amuse myself by going to the library and finding out as much as I could 
about 60 randomly chosen verses of the Bible. This became the so-called 316 Project because I decided to focus on the 16th verse of the third chapter of each biblical book. It's a strange thing to do, perhaps, but next week I'm going to explain why it makes perfect sense. So, you, yes. so, so meanwhile, please trust me. Uh, just trust me. The, the main point is that in this way I could read what people of all different religious persuasions had said, and, and, and people from many different periods of history, and I could read what they had written about those verses. To my surprise, I learned so much from this exercise that I decided I really ought to share the experience with other people. Eventually, it became clear to me that I should look even more thoroughly at the history of those verses, and then I should try to write a book about them. Perhaps I thought such a book would appeal to a few of my colleagues who are by nature turned off by almost all the other books that deal with religion. The title of the book that I should write was clear. It had to be called 316. I began to write 316 during the 1985-86 academic year when I happened to be living in Boston. In fact, it's the Boston connection. It was another big reason why I succumbed to the temptation to come here and give these lectures. It seems that this is the part of the world where I've had the best opportunity to study religious issues. That year, 85-86, was a very special year of my life. It was the 25th year of, of uh, my marriage to Jill, and I had promised her that she could at last have a sabbatical year. <laughs> During this year, I would do all the shopping and cooking and cleaning while she could r write books. Well, um, some days after finishing the household chores, I did have a few extra hours to kill, so I went to the Bible Museum to copy down the 316 verses in dozens of different translations, and, then, and I also spent many, many days at the Boston Public Library looking at hundreds of Bible commentaries. I came several times on the red line to the Andover Harvard Library for books that weren't at Boston Public, and uh, at the end of that year, it turned out that I wrote uh, the chapters of the book about uh, Ecclesiastes and the Song of Solomon, Solomon while I was staying a few days in Cambridge at the home of my publishing partner, Peter Gordon, who lives a few blocks from Harvard Square. That was one week before Harvard's 350th anniversary uh, when they gave an honorary doctorate to Ronald Reagan. Some of you might remember that occasion. Uh, anyway, that was 86. Uh, I, like, I, I like a phrase that was coined by Joseph Sittler who was a guru for many Lutheran pastors in the Midwest a generation or so ago. Sittler said he was especially pleased to have been raised in the Lutheran tradition because it taught him that he didn't need a cerebral bypass operation in order to approach God. <laughs> Martin Luther was a great scholar, a man who used his head and his heart simultaneously. The 316 Project was a turning point in my life because it opened my eyes to what other scholars have written. I learned to appreciate the way God is present in the lives of people from many different cultures. I learned that there were deep connections between Christianity and other world religions. I no longer lived Sunday mornings in a different world from the world I occupied during the rest of the week. During that year in Boston, I attended an ACM conference on computer science education. Well, um, no, actually I didn't go to the conference, I went only to the reception. Um, <laughs> But, but anyway, when people at the reception asked me, what, are you, what have you been doing lately, Don? I uh, had to say sheepishly I had been writing a book about the Bible. Wow, what a conversation stopper. <laughs> um, well, at least you, you would think so. I, I, just, I distinctly remember feeling that I was somehow coming out of the closet um, and that everybody would think I had really lost it. Uh, in those days, it was okay to be religious if you were Jewish, but not if you were Christian. Uh, to my surprise, however, several people were, in, in fact, encouraging, and they expressed an interest in reading uh, drafts of the book before publication. Well, anyway, uh, to make a long story not too long, I, won I finished the book during weekends after returning to Stanford, and it was published in 1990. <clears throat> I'm not here today to sell copies of the book. Um, a good book is going to find I its audience without any hype, and a mediocre book is going to die a quiet death, even if it has wonderful advertising. But I have to tell you something about the 316 book because the experience I had when writing it are what informed much of what I'm going to be talking about in the next lecture because that's when, that's when I had most time to, uh, to think about these issues. Basically, that book discusses what many great theologians of all different persuasions in different ages have said about 
chapter 3, verse 16 of Genesis, about Exodus 3.16, and so on uh, through Revelation 3.16. My conservative friends think the book is too liberal. My liberal friends think it's too conservative. Everybody agrees, however, that the artwork, artwork in the book is spectacular. I, um, I, I commissioned an artist, a different artist, to, 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 to do calligraphy of each, uh, of each of the 316 verses, and I'm going to be talking about that in the fourth lecture of this series. Uh, the, the, it, the book, it's not a preachy book where I say, here's what I believe and I'm real smart, so you better believe it too. Uh, rather, it's a book where I say, here are some important issues and some different perspectives. Uh, what do you think about them? Now, in the remaining lectures of the series, I've thought of a few dozen things to say that probably, that possibly aren't entirely trivial. Uh, lately, I've gotten a sense that, that people uh, are developing a craving for better understanding of relations between uh, scientific work and faith. Uh, contributions of physicists, biologists, cosmologists, and theologians uh, that I've read about have been extremely valuable, but I do feel that a computer science perspective can add many things that so far have been missing from these important discussions. Um, a lot of computer scientists have no doubt come up with similar or better ideas than the ones I'm going to be bringing up in these lectures, and other people will no doubt be able to explain the ideas better than I can. Still, now that I have this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, I want to uh, uh, put the ideas on the table and give them my best shot. I certainly hope that these lectures are going to prove to be helpful to you as you ponder the mysteries of life in the future. Now, um, you might have noticed that I was reading these notes. Um, uh, it's, it's interesting, a uh, fact about C.P. Snow's two cultures. Have, have any of you ever been to a, a convention of English teachers? And you, did you know that they actually read their papers to each other word for word? Uh, it, it blows the mind to think of that. Well, of course, computer, in computer scientists, we always uh, just stand up there and talk. Um, uh, now, um, uh, you know, I, I know my pastor always reads his sermon. Um, um, and so uh, here today, I didn't know whether I should read um, uh, or, 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 just, or just talk, but I thought I'd, be, I'd, I'd better be safe and try to read since it has a little bit to do with, uh, with faith. Uh, but, the, but, uh, but the other thing is, uh, I'm only half prepared. Uh, namely, uh, my plan was for these lectures that I would be 50% uh, uh, planned in advance and 50% improv improvised. So these lectures are not only about interaction between faith and science, but also interaction between me and you. And, and so now, you know, starting at this point, or, or whenever I happen to, to, uh, to get to it in the in the other lectures, I'd like to open it up for discussion so that, uh, you know, since my only preparation was living 60 years to, or <laughs> in order to get here today. Um, so so I, um, I, I hope someone has a, has a question. That, that way I can, I can focus on what you really want to hear. Yes? Yeah, the question is, there are so many different versions. Why did I choose... 316. Is it because the square root of 10 is 3.16 or something like this? <laughs> um, and the answer is come, come next week. <laughs> That's the answer. Oh, yeah. What Bible did you use? What? What Bible did I use? Yeah, well, as I said, I went to the Bible Museum to, to look at every Bible I could get my hands on. So I... So I, uh, I um, uh, I, I, I wound up, you know, in Boston Public Library, I found a lot of Bibles that I hadn't seen anywhere, and the Bible Museum has a room full, full of Bibles, and I, and I found a lot of Bibles there. Um, uh, new Bibles were coming out during the time I was doing this project, uh, and, uh, and so I, uh, uh, and, uh, I, I, I went back to the, um, uh, you know, the Bible that preceded the King James Bible, um, the, 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 first, the first English Bible, um, and I had about uh, 60 different translations that I that I wrote out. Actually, it took it took much longer than I expected to write out these things in longhand. But I, but for every verse, I wrote out 60 translations of it, and uh, and I got writer's cramp. Um, now, uh, uh, the third lecture in this series is going to be about translating the Bible. And what I what I finally decided to do was to make my own translations. And uh, that, as I'm going to explain then, was one of the best decisions I ever made. <laughs> yeah. 
standard size. I, I, I use the the canonical books, not the apocrypha. If I had, if I wanted to, to discuss to, to study the apocrypha someday, though, I would start out probably by looking at chapter three, verse sixteen, just because I, <laughs> I you know, I'm, in, I'm into that. Yes, over here. Yes. Um, your colleagues who you related to from the point of view of the scientific culture in your previous life or just who knew you only as a computer scientist and your relationship with them how do you how do they relate to you now that you've uh, now they know that you okay, believe okay. in a so how do my colleagues relate to me now that now that I published this book well you, you know you have this this faith this sense of yeah. feeling uh, well, let me let me uh, explain that in, in a couple of different ways. First of all, at least to, to, to my face, they seem to they seem to, to like it. I don't know what they're saying to each. <laughs> yeah, I, I I don't know what they're saying to each other in emails and stuff. But uh, but uh, no, actually, uh, the, uh, it, just the opposite. That uh, I I've gotten uh, an amazing um, you know the, um, amazingly positive ma mail, uh, you know, you know, a, lot, a lot of feedback from this. Now I I don't flaunt. Uh, I don't flaunt this particularly, you know. I and I, you know, it's, it's wait, wait for somebody to ask me. Um, uh, one time, um, for example, um, I uh, well, well, okay. Uh, I don't like to wear suits, but I like to wear every once in a while something that's a little bit, a little bit dressed up. You know, I have a special shirt on today. Can you, you catch this? <laughs> and and my wife uh, m made a Christmas present for me that was based on a on an old Egyptian pattern, but it was then embroidered by a, a woman from Cambodia who, who, was a, who was, had been sponsored by our church. And she was the best uh, embroiderer in her village, and she made an absolutely gorgeous uh, decoration on this, on, on, on this thing that I can wear. You know? And uh, well, I, I wore it once to, uh, to Brown University when I got one of those doctorates Anne was talking about. Then people said, oh, here's the high priest of, of computer programming. <laughs> um, now, but the thing was, it was much more like a high priest's robe when, when, I, when I first got it because she had put on the back a great big cross. And I, I couldn't feel right wearing that cross uh, be, uh, because it, I thought it was too much of a, you know, too much of an in-your-face uh, uh, thing. Um, I, I'm not ashamed of it, of it, but I just, that's just the way I am, you know, that... Uh, uh, I, I figure if, if, you know, if, if, if something about my life is... Is is, uh, is 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 Christian or whatever? That's fine, but uh, but I'm not going to try to uh, uh, to get somebody else and 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 say, well, you better do it too. Um, uh, and and uh, but but uh, generally the, the the reaction has 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 been warm, as far as I know, <laughs> and and uh, in fact uh, much warmer than I would have ever predicted. Yeah. You. Are there any ways? So, there any ways in which my study of theology has informed my work with computer science? Well, um, only indirectly, I would say. It doesn't. Uh, I, I would find, since it gives me more of a sense of history, that I know that, that I that, that I understand more about the development of of of, of ideas in science uh, because. Uh, Science and religion have, in fact, uh, not always been so separated as they are now. And so, and so, for example, I could read uh, things that. Uh, well, I, Isaac Newton, it turned out, wrote a about 30 pages about First Timothy 3:16, um, <coughs> and I, I would have never looked at that before. See, um, and so this gave me a little bit of a more uh, feeling for uh, for uh, Isaac Newton. Um, I. Uh, uh, and and uh, but, but it's it's a historical connection. I I, you know, I run into I'm very interested as a scientist in how ideas get started in the first place. And so the, the more source materials I, I read, the the better. And I and uh, so so it has helped in that way. But but otherwise, I, I, it's mostly to for the other aspects of my life, the part that you know makes me want to feel feel like a, uh, like something as as an, as part of an ongoing part of an ongoing system. Question in the way back. Well, no, that's fine. That's fine. You've referred several times to a computer science perspective. Yeah. How do you distinguish that from other? Okay, actually, uh, 
I, I guess I, I, I have a kind of a radical idea about this, um, but uh, I, I've had it for 30 years now, and I haven't, and and still haven't been, haven't been shaken in it. And that is that, uh, uh, if someone says, why is why did computer science uh, gel so fast and all of a sudden become a department at almost every university in the world? The reason was not because computers are so valuable uh, as 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 tools. So uh, you know, we, there's not a department of electron microscope science at, at every university, and so on. But electron microscopes are, are great, you know, are great and powerful things, and so on. Um, the reason that I'm convinced uh, computer science uh, uh, grew so fast and and is and is so vi uh, vital today is because there were there were people all over the all over the world who had this way of thinking that that a computer scientist has, um, it, uh, or, or you know, it's not a, a sharp focus, but it's uh, but it's it's different enough from from other ways of thinking. I was talking about physicists and mathematicians. It's different enough from that that they were all sitting in other departments. And suddenly, when, there, when, when it turned out that their way of thinking correlated well with being able to make a computer do tricks, then um, they found each other. And, and, and so it was this way of thinking, this is what I call a computer science perspective. Now, this is was, this, this way of thinking which brought them together into departments, and they, they, met, they, they met other people who, 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 had the, you know, who, would, who would understand the same analogies and would, and, would, uh, and, and, would, and would structure knowledge in their heads about the same way. And that's and, and and that's what I meant by when I said computer science perspective. It's the thing that see I I I, I didn't choose computer science because uh, uh, because uh, um, one of my missions in life was to advance computation. I chose computer science because I was good at it. It just happened that 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 my 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 peculiar way of thinking uh, correlated well with uh, with computers. But but uh, but uh, I, I I'm sure that people had this way of thinking. Uh, hundreds of years ago, and, and I, I think I can recognize it in, in, in some of their writings, the ones who would have been computer scientists if there had been computer science. You know, th there had to be, there had, there was a time when physicists were called natural philosophers, you know, and there was a time before chemistry, ha chemists had a department, and, and uh, so, you know, just the fact that computer science happened to have, have uh, gotten its name later, uh, you know, it doesn't mean that 100 years from now it's not going to be the same as 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 every other field. It's just a historical accident that it that it came about a little different time. But the, but it's a way of thinking that that um, is characterized by uh, well, it's a, I, I distinguish it. Uh, one of the main characteristics is the jumping between levels of abstraction very quickly between low level and high level uh, without the, almost you know unconsciously. And another thing is the computer scientist uh, tends to be able to deal with non-uniform structures, um, uh, you know, case one, case two, case three. Uh, and while uh, uh, a ma mathematician will tend to want one unifying you know, axiom that governs the whole thing, and um, and it, this is the this is a weakness of computer science when we when we get to a theory that that, that can be done by one axiom, but we'll still give it five. Because you know, because it, because there's no, there's no sweat for us to, to, to you know. But it's it, but we're, we're at our uh, we're at our best in, in, in things when they when no simple theory does explain it, and then and then we can handle the handle the the, the dichotomy you know, the the, the, uh, the the discrepancies between the different things. So so uh, that's what I, I I tend to think is is uh, is different about computer scientists, and I find about one person in fifty has this way of of looking at stuff. Yes, yeah, so, uh, right at at the wall. Uh, other religions, uh, like other, like religions yeah, uh, uh, in, in expanding knowledge, no, that's what you get from the government grant. You don't get that from the Stanford Endowment. Uh, Stanford Endowment goes for teaching. So, so the similar thing like that. That I, I'm thinking, you know, what 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 uh, uh, are are the hours in a in a in a classroom for teaching uh, 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 supposed to supposed to do? Uh, a, a seminar like this is is, is off, you know, it's off the chart. So, yes, in, in purple. Um, are you going to get to play the organ while you're here? I'm worried about it. Will be away. Am I going to get to play the organ while I'm here? This is. Um, I, I, I had a great opportunity the, the previous year in Boston, and and so I know there's lots of wonderful organs, in, uh, and uh, I've been offered a chance to play on a fine hook hook, hook organ in uh, Andover, um, and uh, may, and maybe some others, but. Um, uh, I have to get these lectures in shape first. <laughs> yes. What do you think about the uh, rate of uh, 
the growth of computer science and also what types of uh, expectations do you have for the future of uh, computer science? What do I think about the growth of computer, rate of growth of computer science? I, you know, I, I really wish that it would slow down so that I could finish my book. So, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, I, I keep, I, I keep hoping that, that, that some things will, will keep people busy enough that you know, some, some bad ideas will come along and, and, and suck in a lot of people to, you know, like, <laughs> like, like Java, you know, I'm just teasing. <laughs> um, but, uh, but it, it doesn't happen. And computer science keeps getting bigger and broader and deeper, and, uh, and uh, um, I, I can't predict that it's going to go on um, at this rate. Uh, uh, you know, Amdahl's law certainly, I mean, uh, Moore's law certainly can't go on, but, uh, but I mean, uh, computer science, uh, 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 will, will computer science still be growing 50 years from now? Uh, um, it's hard for me to, to say that with confidence. I would say biology, I could say with confidence, will be growing 200 years from now. It, it, biology, much more rich subject than computer science, uh, just by its nature, has so much more to deal with. But computer science, still, we have no indication of any slowdown whatsoever. Uh, yes. You mentioned some of the could, could I mention some of the theologians I found compatible with my culture? Well, okay, so I'm, I tend to be a detail-oriented person, as you can guess, um, and so the ones that w the, the ones that a and so are a lot of theologians, really. In fact, I, what, as I was writing this book, it wasn't that different from writing my computer books, except I wasn't doing I wasn't using integral signs as much and things, you know. <laughs> but but I, but the, the processes of abstraction and uh, um, and, uh, and 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 generalization and uh, are, are are much the same, uh, and. Uh, and, and uh, interpreting text, uh, really, the the uh, I, I would say th there wasn't that much difference in in mentality of, uh, 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 between them, except for, well, well, expertise in languages, which is which uh, has a lot of nuances, which I which I don't which I don't understand. I can only uh, I can only um, uh, you know believe what I read. Um, but the um, but the people that would be. Uh, actually, I'm going to talk. Uh, the, the fifth lecture is about what what I learned about uh, about um, God during this project, and what I learned about theolo theologians during this project. And so I I prefer to talk a little more about that at that time. Yes. Say something about your thoughts on the value of prayer. My thoughts on the value of prayer. Um, uh, I I should probably be praying now. I. Um, <laughs> I uh, what that somebody will ask me an easier question um, no um, no it, actually um, I don't know I don't know why but I think but I believe there is a value to prayer and, and one of the things I want to want I want to do uh, before this series of lectures is over is put up a on the web a uh, a, a wonderful parable um, which w explains why I think that it, the parable itself has nothing to do with prayer it's called Planet Without Laughter. It's a book. It's a little short story by Raymond Smolian, and it's in a book that's out of print. I've got permission from him to uh, to put it on the web, but I'm still waiting for permission from the publisher. Um, because when you see that, it, you'll, you, I, I think you'll, you'll you'll get the idea where somehow I, I know sometimes that that prayer works, but I don't know why. <laughs> yeah. um, but uh, it's but. I can only say that and nobody can prove it. And I don't think God wants uh, it to be provable. Um, so, yes? Uh, what sorts of analysis that you run across in computer science prove to be most useful uh, in, in doing this research? And as a side question, were these sorts of thoughts more common in the, uh, in the writers that you read uh, from various religious texts than uh, you'd expect from writers at large? Yeah, actually, no, you know, there wasn't that much quantitative stuff in in, in the in the religious text, but but uh, obviously, um, but the in fact there there was uh, it turned out that Numbers three sixteen of all things was about numbers, and uh, and uh, so I uh, um, so there was some interesting mathematics in there. But the but the most uh, the, no, the most quantitative things I could say I'll, I'll talk a little bit about this next week. The most quantitative thing I could I, I could get was. Um, was a study of randomness, and uh, and so that's you know, next week I 
I, I, I talk about that at length. But, um, but there are uh, uh, there are qualitative things. There are qualitative things <laughs> that that are informed by by analysis. So, for example, knowing the idea that I could prove a program correct helps me to to um, to write a program, even though I'm not going to prove it correct. Um, uh, you know, I, I I don't have the for, have the time to to go and check that the program for tech is is uh, is actually 100% correct. I don't know how to I don't know how to formulate uh, the concept that that a Metafont program draws a, a beautiful letter A or not. Um, so I can't prove that that program is correct. But still, somehow, the theory that I've learned um, while, doing, while doing computer science gives me more confidence in these programs that I have. It's, a, it's a kind of a similar thing. I, I don't have a direct connection between numbers and, and uh, this work on, on the Bible. I, I have just, uh, it's just a methodology that's sort of informed by working with numbers that also can work with, with uh, um, less quantitative stuff. There's lots and lots of hands. How are we, what are we going to do here? Um, let me go way back there. Do you, have any, uh, do you have any comments or conclusions regarding the existence and the nature of evil? <laughs> comments, and, <laughs> comments and conclusions about the existence and knowledge of evil. That um, that's probably one of the great. Uh, the, the question is, for example, why um, you know why uh, uh, are people uh, uh, killed in wars and stuff? Um, and uh, uh, I'll be getting to this later on, but uh, but I don't have a, I don't have any new insights that I that I haven't that I haven't picked up from uh, fr from other people. And the book of uh, you know the book of Job discusses this and comes to and and it's uh, and tries to come to a conclusion. And if you look at ten commentaries on the book of Job, each one says that the conclusion was different. Um, uh, which means that it's a tough problem, I think. Um, but uh, uh, but still, uh, there must be there, there must be something there. You know, what would what would the world be like if there was no if if there was no evil? Uh, well, I will be trying to get at this more in the fifth and sixth lectures. Yes, in the middle. My idea uh, that, that the computer the human brain is is a giant computer program that. Is um, uh, it is uh, um, hard to hard to prove or disprove, I guess. Um, but uh, uh, I, I I I'm not sure how. Uh, uh, okay, they, I, I I tend to believe that that the, the, the new new models of the brain that are that are based on the idea of of continuous dynamic evolution as w as we talk, uh, as, as and, and to explain consciousness are are, are right on, um, but uh, I um, but that that would mean that there's a lot of randomness involved in that, and so uh, and so uh, I, I, I I'm going to talk a little bit more about that also in the later in the later lectures. I um, but um, I, I, I'm using that as an excuse too often. I guess um, the <coughs> the um, uh, but, but you know, maybe the brain uses random, uh, uh, ra random elements, or maybe these things come from come in some way that are, you know, that are controlled by prayers or whatever. Uh, who, who knows? It might be we might only be seeing one dimension of, uh, th I mean, three dimensions of some other uh, 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 of some other re reality. I, I'm going to try to explore these questions from my limited viewpoint. Uh, later on, but I don't have a I don't have the definitive answer. <laughs> yes. You mentioned earlier when asked about the relationship of computer science problems to the theological reading, there wasn't much talk about the theology. But some of your computer science work on literate programming deals with things that are very hard to quantify, things like readability and ease of understanding. And I'm wondering if you found parallels between that work and the work that you you've done reading the theologians. Okay, so so, so uh, he's saying that that that's, some of my work is on is not on on theorem proving and and so on, but more on methodology, where I where I think something uh, uh, where I write a computer program and I feel 
happy about it, not because, uh, not because I proved that it was correct, but because I felt it was elegant or something like this. So, so there's this aspect of aesthetics. Um, and um, I, 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 yeah, I, I believe um, that all the non-quantitative things probably carry over very much to the, in, 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 in the world of uh, theology. Again, you're stealing away from my, from, from my, fifth, from my fifth lecture. You're, I'm not going to have anything left to say. If you, if you don't. Um, red shirt. Um, the area has changed the human life over the years and had an impact on religion. And I wondered if you had an opinion of what the impact of the existence of computers, the existence of computer science, maybe even simply the bringing together of this community of people who think of will have on future theology. Okay, what, what influence will computer science uh, m maybe have on, on theology? Um, there's uh, the, the simple, you know, the, the simple answer is there's there's a lot of resources that are that are much easy make it much easier now to approach uh, 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 to approach this vast this vast literature and you can you can you know you, you can click on a word and find out what the Greek was and you can find out where that Greek word was used elsewhere and so on uh, uh, so um, uh, the, so many uh, uh, many aids to 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 self exploration are going to come out of uh, just of having the ha having the technology and having you know having a home page for the Book of Mark you know and so on um, where where, where you know, for, for every part of the Bible there will be, and, and other religions there there will be there will be um, surveys of uh, of things that people can refine and make make more accessible than than uh, than things were before to the people who want to explore in their own patterns um, now. Uh, w Will it change to other to, to other ways of 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 re revelation of God? This is this is a really interesting question. I haven't thought about it, uh, much. Uh, uh, there's this general notion of process theology uh, called, which uh, says that um, over the over the centuries, God has been uh, revealing Himself herself in different ways. Um, <coughs> And when I first heard about that, it sounded to me like, uh, uh, you, you know, nonsense because uh, I had always been taught that God was one, you know, the same today, not uh, yesterday and today and forever. Um, but then um, the more I thought about it, it was the only sensible thing to do that, that God would, would not explain things, uh, you know, uh, uh, 2,000 years ago in terms of molecules, uh, he, 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 uh, even though... Uh, you know, molecules are there. Uh, people didn't know what molecules were, so so Jesus wouldn't talk about molecules, you know, um, and and so on. Um, that in fact, it, it only makes sense that that different kinds of revelation um, are appropriate a, as the uh, the people in the world uh, change. So, it's a very good question. Um, I, I I'm I'm. I'm worried that that somebody will start a a new religion based on fractals. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I mean, in other words, uh, religion has a certain a, a certain uh, power that that charlatans can take advantage of, and uh, and so if you come up with something that is that is, that you know makes a little bit of sense and and has a little bit of mystery to it, uh, you can get a lot of people fooled by it, and so. So, uh, so, uh, so, you know, I also have that in mind, that as a, as a possible danger. Yeah, way back. Uh, if you were to give a lecture for an audience of theologians on the subject of computer science, um, what would you talk about? What could they? If I were to give a lecture to an audience of theologians, <laughs> now, ha have you ever given a? Yeah, no, let, let me let me tell you that the that uh, uh, the, the, the amount of terror that, that, that lives in a speaker's stomach when giving a lecture is proportional to the, to, to the amount he doesn't know about his audience. Um, and and I, it was hard enough for me once at Caltech, I gave lectures to biologists about computer science, and that was one of the hardest I ever had to do. Um, no, I, I would think, though, that I could explain to, um, to, to the people that, whose readings I, I've read I could explain to them some some interesting ideas about infinity that that they might be able to to, to get some uh, uh, some ideas from and uh, 
Um, maybe I'll be able to go into some of that in the sixth lecture. Two more questions is the, is the limit here. Anna, will you choose uh, uh, who's going to? perspective and that you can computer scientists like to abstract things and, and say okay I got this a handle on this and, and with, with religious matters that may not be possible you can't think of prayer as a black box that you know here's what I, tell you, here's what I get out and so I wonder if you see that, that danger that people think they've got a handle on stuff that they really don't yeah, yeah. Are. so he says I was talking about the computer science perspective isn't there a, isn't there a danger that that this could that this could be the wrong perspective to apply to to theology and absolutely in fact um, you know, although this article by Newton about uh, Timothy, First Timothy 3:16, turned out to be really, uh, I, I, I admired it a lot. He, he, he studied a lot of uh, a lot of manuscripts of Greek papyri and so on, and, and as to where somebody had made a, a copying error uh, in, in, in in this passage, and and and, and he, he nailed. You know, he, he nailed the, the, the manuscript where it was, and this was a, a, an original contribution that Newton made to theology. But he wrote other bo other writings about the Book of Daniel and Revelation, where he took where he took these these very very mystical symbolic books and he treated them as mathematical formula and axioms. And you know, he, he tried to say, well, you know, if, if assuming this, then this must be true, and so on. And I felt so sorry for him. <laughs> and. And similarly, I'm sure that I that, that, that I can make that, that, that I can make mistakes like that too. But still, I you know I have a right to, to my mistakes. <laughs> Anna, one more. In your uh, speech, you mentioned finding the three sixty book as a turning point in your life. It implies there's some part of you that was going in one direction, so now going in another. Can you say more about that? What's changed? Okay, so. So what? So why did I say it was a turning point in my life? You know, it wasn't a 180 degree turn, but it it, it opened it, it opened the um, uh, it it opened my eyes more to to uh, things that I hadn't uh, ha had a motivation to to look at before. The way other people are, uh, the way other people practice their religion, the the history of of uh, of, 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 of uh, you know of different uh, uh, different strains of Christianity uh, and. Uh, and I, I felt also it was a turning point in the sense that, well, it, it gave me overconfidence. <laughs> um, in, in other words, before I hadn't read much, and so and so I, I could only feel that you know uh, may, maybe I was missing something. Now I've read enough that I feel that I know everything which I don't. I mean, I I I, 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 I it, it it changed it it gave me more confidence, and maybe that, that's a, a better or, or worse thing, but. But uh, it, it did at least, you know, I, when I did this project, uh, um, there were no holds barred on what I was going to look at. I was going to explore wh whatever had been been said by by everybody, and I, and let you know, let them shoot their ammunition whichever way, way it would go. And and uh, after I had uh, after I had done that, and and and, and still uh, uh, you know you know come through with what I felt was a uh, you, you know. A strong enough faith to, to to get through the rest of my life. Um, this was uh, this gave me this confidence, which which I couldn't have had before I I did the experiment. Okay. Well, thank you very much.